Hey, well, good morning, everybody. Aren't you glad you came to church already? Come on, somebody. Yeah, what a great morning that was. Incredible. Hey, we are in this series today that we started last week on Easter called Resilient. Let's all say that word together resilient, just this idea that we need to know how, what it looks like to follow Jesus in a world that's falling apart. And last week, we just highlighted this reality that we have a living hope and that our, our hope walked out of the grave. Amen goes right there, right? We, our hope walked out of the grave and we live in a world that wants to do a few things with our hope. Number one, it wants to steal our hope. Have you ever heard the phrase, don't get your hopes up, don't count on it, don't hold your breath. If it can go wrong, it will go wrong. And so we have a world that would try to steal our hope, but also a world that offers false hopes for us. Like how many false hopes do we get in life? You know, it used to be um, that you could eat eggs. Now you can't eat eggs anymore, right? They stole our hope there. So you keto fans, they're back. Yeah, that's what I heard. I heard, Andy, yeah. Eggs are back. Um, wine, you know, you could drink that. Now you can't. That's a bummer. Um, coffee. And then, you know, I mean, cryotherapy's next. Like, they're going to find that, that cryotherapy kills you. Mark my words. Anything that that's, that's that painful, you know, we get these false hopes that come into our lives. And we need to learn what it means to be resilient, to stand firm, to be rooted in a life so that when the winds and storms of life come against us and when we get these false hopes that offer us life that it can't deliver, that we know how to continue to move forward with resiliency and to live with hope. Because here's what I know about you. Like you want to be a person of hope. Amen. Like you want to be a person of hope. You want to be the kind of person that when, when a party is happening, you're the first on the invite list because they want you to show up and bring some hope. Man, you want to be the kind of person that when, when you call and your friend or someone sees your name on caller ID, they answer it. They don't just send it to voicemail, right? Like you want to be the kind of person that lives with hope because we are better when we have anticipation of the future. Man, we are better when we have a living hope. Man, our, our moods are better. We don't procrastinate as much. Our health is better. We have less anxiety. We have less stress. We have less depression. We actually weigh less. Hello, somebody. Like, it is crazy what hope, a living hope, will bring you. But, but we don't want to just be people that just live with hope in here. We want to put hope on the move out there. Hello? Like, we want to be the kind of people that wherever we go, hope is spilling out of our lives into the lives of other people. And so in order for us to do that, we've been, we, are, we launched last week, the series is a study in a book called First Peter in the Bible. It's written by a guy named Peter, maybe some of you. How many of you guys have heard of Peter? Like a handful? Like Peter's the guy we can relate to. Come on. I uh, love Peter. He's the guy that was less than perfect. Let's just say it that way. I had some, had some warts and bumps and had some bruises to show for it. But, but, but let me just set the historical context for this, this letter that he's writing to help us understand a little bit how it impacts us. So Peter started out as a fisherman. Then he became a follower of Jesus. Then he became one of his top three. Then he became a defector. Then he became a pastor and a church planner. And so now Peter is actually on the run in the Roman Empire because in this culture, Christians were not looked on with a lot of favor. There's a, there's a statement made, made by a historian named Tacitus that said, Romans viewed Christians as enemies against society and as hating the human race. Like, like, why is that? Well, number one was because the way they lived their lives just rejected paganism and polytheism. It rejected uh, the sexual promiscuity of the Roman Empire. Um, it, it rejected idol worship and emperor worship. So just their very lives... Uh, were, were a statement against what was happening in culture. Man, they weren't standing on the street boycotting. boycotting. They didn't have sandwich boards on saying God hates whatever group this is in. They just, by their very lives, they were, they were a testimony against some of the behaviors that was happening. Sound familiar? Now, now there's more to this story, though. So, so to really understand kind of what was going on in the climate, if you look at the Roman world, you had, you had a guy who was in charge. His name was Nero. Now, now, Nero was about one thing. Nero was about Nero. You know anybody like that? And Nero wanted to rebuild Rome in his image. Like he wanted every building to have his name on it. He wanted to say, Trump, I mean, Nero Towers on it. <laughs> Nero's palace, right? He wanted Nero to be everywhere. So what Nero did was he burned Rome to the ground roughly about this time in history. It may have happened a little before this letter was written or maybe a little after, but this will just help paint the climate that Christians were living in. 
So, so when there began an uprising in Rome because Nero had burned the city down, he needed a scapegoat. And his scapegoat of choice was Christians. So Nero blamed Christians, and so Christians were then used for sport. They would put them in coliseums and, just, and, pay, uh, and buy tickets to come and watch lions eat them. They would feed them to dogs. They would persecute them. They would torture them. Nero even lined the streets with Christians who were burning just to provide lights at night. Like, this is the climate. And so when Peter writes this letter, Peter is actually living in Rome. And he's undercover. He's covert. So Peter uses, um, he says, I'm in, writing from Babylon. This was code word for Rome. Like in the Old Testament, Babylon was this evil superpower, and in the New Testament, Rome is the, is the evil superpower. And as Peter writes this letter, he doesn't want the mail carriers, the people carrying this letter, to be, to, to, for his letter to be confiscated and for them to find him. So he is writing this letter covertly, and what Peter is trying to do for his people and for us today is help us to understand what does it look like to live with resilient marriages? Like how do we, how do we parent kids who live with resiliency? And how do we have a resilient life when we face difficulties in life, when we go through trials, when we go through confusion? How do we live with this idea of resiliency? So today what I'm going to do is I'm going to unpack uh, verses 13 to 25, and I'm just going to really walk through it almost just uh, piece by piece, because this is just going to show us how we can learn to live resiliently. We're going to have some takeaways today that we can take away, not just for today, but, but for Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. So in, in 1 Peter chapter and Thursday, Friday, Saturday, too, in case you thought you were off on that. Come on. I know what you're thinking, right? Um, so in verse 13, it says this. It's therefore. Now, whenever you see a therefore in the Bible, you always ask, what is it there for, right? It's connecting to what was just taught previously, which was last week, when we talked about the inheritance that we have. So Peter is writing this word, therefore, because he's pointing back to uh, the living hope that we have in the inheritance, that, that, that this world is not our home. Right? So everything he's about to say is to remind us how to live in a world that is not our home. He says, therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus. So let's just start out with that phrase, preparing your mind for action. Preparing your mind for action. Now, now that, that phrase in the original language means to gird the loins of your mind. Now, now, when I say gird your loins, I, you probably haven't used that word, phrase this week, have you? Right? Like, it's a little weird. Let me explain it just a second. So, so in that culture, you would have had uh, Romans, and they would have had, like, long robes. We would have called them togas in college. You got that? Um, some of you know, if you know, you know. And so you would have these long robes. And so they weren't very, they weren't conducive to moving quickly. They weren't conducive to work. So what they would do is they would take the robes, they would take them, they would tuck them in their belt so they could do some work. So they could maybe fight in a battle. Maybe they could run from a bear, right? They needed to be able to move. And we would say it more like, hey, we would roll up your sleeves. Like you can't do work when your sleeves are down. You got to roll your sleeves up to do work. And so what Peter is saying is you have to be prepared to fight for the life that you want. Amen? Right? You have to be prepared to fight for the hope that you want. I'm not talking about fighting another person. I'm talking about there's a hope that's out there, and we have to know what it means to prepare our minds to fight for that kind of hope. Now, he says, prepare your minds for action. Get ready. Don't just wake up and let the day happen to you. Like, don't be passive and just sit back. Prepare your mind for the day that's coming. And then, then he goes on to say that. He says, be sober-minded. Be sober-minded. Now, now, here's the thing. What's the opposite of sober? The opposite of sober is drunk. And we know, we know a little bit about being drunk. Like, you've seen it at least on television. You know how smart drunk people are, don't you? Like, they say things that are just intriguing Man, just insightful, drunk people do. Um, and they say them with such clarity, don't they? And have you ever heard someone talk about this? Like, you know, when you drink, you're just more of yourself. You know, you just, you, all your inhibitions go down. You know who said that? A drunk person said that. <laughs> like, it's, it's, we know, man, when you get drunk, you don't say things that make sense. You are not clear-minded. You're not clear-minded. So what Peter is saying is you got you to keep your head in the game. You got to be clear minded. You got to know what your life's about and you got to know where to keep your focus because we live in a world that's full of so many distractions. We live in a world with so many distractions. You know how many times the average person touches their phone? 2,000 times a day. 2,000 times a day. And I don't know that Satan's great ploy 
is for us to steal a lot of money from a bank or to run our lives off the road in a shipwreck. He just wants to keep us distracted. And sometimes the worst thing we can do is just spend too many hours scrolling on our phone, just at mind-numbing nothing. There you go. <laughs> now, is that from experience, Andy? I just didn't know, man. <laughs> Thank you. That's awesome. And so, it, 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 and we think about all the things that we have opportunity to get distracted with. Man, you have your phone, and again, there's good stuff for phone. I never want to be the old guy that's anti-phone, but I'm just saying reality is reality. Um, but if you think about all the entertainment options that we have, like, and think about all the series that we can watch on Netflix or Amazon Prime or Hulu or whatever. And, and people are always asking, hey, what are you watching? I need a good show to watch. There's like 5 million different series on right now. But we, we're so distracted with so many options. Like, how many restaurants can we go eat at in a week? You know what I'm saying? Like, like, we live in a world that's so distracted, we have to have laws that tell us not to text and drive. Like, that's how distracted we are in life. And it's distracting us from the thing that actually is where our hope should lie. It actually, here's the thing, our minds matter. Listen, your mind, it matters. It matters where you put your thoughts. It matters where you put your eyes. It matters where you put your brains. Listen, so, so Paul, Peter is saying, listen, we, we have to keep a sober mind. We have to choose what, to dwell, we have to choose what we're gonna dwell on in life. We have, to, we have to choose what our minds are gonna think on. There's a passage over in Philippians chapter four where um, Paul is a guy writing this. He says, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Think about these things. You have to choose that. Listen, when, you, when we're scrolling and looking at news, what's it bringing? Is it bringing you wholehearted joy and comfort and calmness? Or is it bringing anxiety in your life? And so we need to learn what it means to choose the things that we're gonna think through and filter through we need to learn to focus our mind on the things that really matter. Focus our mind on the things that really matter. Listen, be sober-minded. If you want to live a life of resiliency, a life that's just full and overflowing with hope everywhere you go, your mind matters. you gotta, got to determine what you're going to think about. And then he says this. He says, uh, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So if our minds are not fully on God, they're, they're, they're fully on something else. Right? We're worshiping something else if, we're not, if our minds aren't fully on God. You know, so we'll set our hope on other people. We may set our hope on a politician. We may set our hope on a philosophy. We may set our hope on kind of the cultural, uh, the friends that we hang out with and the culture that we live in. We may, we may start to worship our spouse and spouses make terrible saviors, but they're great spouses, right? We may set our worship and fully on our children, which seems to be a little bit more prevalent in our area than in many areas. And we'll set our, our hope fully on our finances or on our title or on our reputation. And we won't set our hope fully on God. And so, so we have to be able to set our hope fully on God because there's going to be a grace to be revealed in us is what Peter just said. He said, think about this. There is a time coming in the future after we die and after we go into eternity. And there's a grace that we'll experience then. Now, generally, when we think about grace, we think about the past, don't we? Like the things that we've done, we're so glad we're forgiven for. Anybody in that camp? Like there's just some regrets that we have, some shame that's back there a year ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And we're so grateful that grace has saved us and rescued us. So we live in that grace today. But there's a grace coming in the future. It's even more powerful and more important. And that's when we'll see him face to face. Oh, my goodness. Can you just think of that day? Like if you're here today, maybe you're don't, not a follower of Jesus. I just want you to imagine if you come face to face with the one person who loves you more than anybody, with the one person who's just done all the good they possibly could do for you, with the one person who gave their life for you, with the one person who just has kind and compassionate understanding of everything that you've experienced, of every speed bump that you went over, of every train wreck that happened in your life that just offers you hope and forgiveness. Can you imagine coming face to face with him? Like this is the grace that we'll have in the future. This is the grace that we'll have when we come face to face. It says that we will, we will see him as he is. Come on. Just what a beautiful picture we have of Jesus. Now, now I just want you, I'm going to give you a to-do for this week. What if, what if every day this week, th three minutes, you woke up, you got a cup of coffee because that's the first thing you do in the morning. Who, who gets coffee first thing in the morning? 
not as many as I thought. You guys, some of you guys, like, are missing out, right? <laughs> you got up, whatever you do in the morning, drank some water and lemon and had your, cry, had your cryotherapy. Um, because that's how I actually do water and lemon first. But, um, and, and then you just had three minutes. You just thought about eternity. This is, what, this is how you set your day up. Like, this is, this is for real. You should do this. Just sit down and just think about, man, what's it going to be like to be face-to-face? What's it going to be like for everything to be restored? What's it going to be like for my brokenness to be whole? What's it going to be like for my tears to be wiped away? And just begin and just see what, how that changes how you see the world how your world and the world that's out there. Your mind matters. We have to set our hope fully on the grace that's going to be revealed in us. And then, and then we see in verse 14, he kind of starts a little bit of a, he kind of continues down this road in a, in a more deep and intense way. And he just kind of shows us that, man, half-hearted lives just aren't going to move hope. Half-hearted lives just won't move hope. Watch what happens in verse 14. It says, as obedient children, like we know what that means. Right, you know, you know, when you, if you have a child and they're obedient, what do they do? Whatever you tell them to do, that's what they do. As obedient children, don't be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but he, but as he has called you, is holy. You also be holy in your conduct, since it is written, "You shall be holy, for I am holy." So I just want to take this idea of holiness, and I want to do two things. I want to ele- elevate it in our minds, but I also want to put it on the bottom shelf for us to be able to understand. And that's going to be hard to do in one talk, so it may take a while. Um, the first thing he talks about is, is not to conform to pressure. He says, do not conform. Uh, as obedient kids, don't be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. In, in other words, don't let the pressure of the world force you into behaving like they behave. Like, like not everything in culture is bad. And I think that's where a lot of times churches and pastors get it wrong is we just rail, they, not we, they rail against everything in culture as if everything is bad. Everything is not bad. However, there are some things in culture that are bad for us. And we don't need to let the pressure or the, the concern about getting canceled conform us to their image is what Peter is saying. And so, and so, There's a quote that says this, what one generation tolerates, the next generation embraces. Let that settle in your soul just a second. Like what one generation tolerates, they say, ah, yeah, not no big deal. The next generation embraces it. And we are reaping that today. Amen? Like we are reaping that. That's not a sign, that's not a statement of judgment. It's just a statement of reality. And so we need to learn what it is that we need to bring God's holiness into. Like, how do we need to obey God more? Now, now, let me just paint a little bit of a picture of holiness, kind of to bring some definition to it. You know, in the Bible, when you have the word holiness, it just means to to be cut out and set apart. Okay? So so holy just means different and separate. But not, not just that. It's different and separate, but not of common use. Because there's some things that you have, we have in our houses that we put as separate, but they're, they're for common use. So take your toothbrush as an example. Like, like I'm hoping that you don't keep your toothbrush where you keep your shoes or your cleaning products, right? Even though it's set apart, it's of common use. I can get a new one tomorrow or this afternoon. So when we have this idea that God is holy, we need to recognize that he is separate and different. Now, now in the, I would call it 40s to 50s to 60s, there were, the pendulum swing began to happen. And there was this idea that God was holy, he was distinct, he was other, he was so far above me I could never get to him. And it showed up in the language that we prayed in. Have you ever heard anyone pray in King James English, even though they spoke Southern? And it just tells you something about their view of God. And so what happened through the Jesus movement, some other things in the 60s and 70s, which wasn't bad, is that it swung, but it swung all the way over here. Jesus is my homeboy, is what some t-shirts would say. Like, Jesus is close. Jesus showed up. And while both of these are true, we have kind of neglected this idea of God's holiness and his separation from us and his moral perfection and his beauty, right? We, We kind of neglected that. And for most people, when we have this idea to define God, we'll use, we'll use this four-letter word, love. 
right? God is love. And in the Bible, the phrase God is love is said twice, and certainly love is one of his attributes. But, but love actually flows out of his holiness. This is God. So, so watch what just, just a couple of a quick uh, passages, vision from the Bible. In Revelation, there's not a screen for this, um, but, but in Revelation chapter 4, there's this image of what's happening around the throne in heaven. And it says this, love, love, love is the Lord God Almighty. It's not what it says, is it? Some of you guys know. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Right? That's the image that we have of God. Over in Isaiah chapter 6 is another place where there's this vision of what's happening in heaven. It says this, holy, holy. Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. It says the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And Isaiah said, woe is me, I'm lost. Right, just this idea of the holiness, the reverence, this understanding of the holiness of God. I mean, he can't be trivialized. He can't be trifled with. And God, God is holy. And listen, because God is holy, because he is distinct from us, God offers a moral vision for our lives that he doesn't apologize for, okay? Like God offers a vision for for our lives, a moral vision for our lives. It's more than morality, but he offers this vision for us, and he doesn't apologize for it. Now, for most of us, when we hear this word holy, man, it it does conjure up some religious residue, if we're honest, doesn't it? Um, it, it conjures up some unattainable rules and laws and goals. For some people, it just sounds boring. Anybody in that camp? Like, this just sounds boring, Stephen. I don't know if I'm into that. That's because maybe we have misunderstood what holiness means. And so God is separate and distinct, and he's called us to do what? Be holy as I am holy. Now, now he, here's the thing about, about his holiness that it comes through obedience to what he wants for us. Now, now I just want to paint this picture for you. The road to the best life you could ever live, the road to joy that you're looking for, the road to the purpose that's built deep in here that you know exists, that road actually is traveled through holiness. Man, we get to that road by holiness. So, So picture it this way. Because God has set up the world, because God has created the world, there is a way that the world works, isn't there? Like there are certain things that work that we just know and we don't don't argue with them. Like let's pick gravity for a second. Like nobody's arguing with gravity. Like I'm not going to walk out and say, I don't think gravity is going to work today and just walk right over here and hurt myself and embarrass myself in front of everybody. Now that could happen on accident for sure. Um, But but like I'm I'm not just going to walk off here. Why? Because gravity, no matter how much I want to debate gravity, gravity is real. And gravity is not changing. And so God has set up the way the world works that's good for us. God has set up sex and marriage and money and parenting and, our, and work and uh, hobbies and entertainment. He set that up in such a way that if we follow him and what he has for us, guess what? We get the life we're actually looking for. But so many times we'd rather just try it our own way. We need a little trial and error. Anybody have to do something wrong before they learn their lesson? Man, we, we tend to be that kind of creature. There's a, there's a quote about that came from the early church, and it says this. It says, they abstain from all impurity in the hope of the recompense that is to come in another world. As for their servants or handmaids or children, they persuade them to become Christians by the love they have for them. And when they become so, they call them without distinction brothers. They don't worship strange gods. They walk in humility and kindness Falsehood is not found among them, and they love one another. And when they see the stranger, they bring him to their homes. They rejoice over him as a true brother, for they don't call those who are after the flesh, but those who are in the spirit and in God, right? They just live this life of impact and influence. Why? Because they followed, they followed what God had for them. And we think so many times that God's holding, holding out on us. Like, God, this is the, and this is the lie that Satan told Eve in the garden. God's holding out on you, right? You, you can eat of that fruit of that tree. That's really good for you. He just knows that you'll, you'll, be, that you'll know more than him. And this is the lie that we get from Satan. When following God's commands, and that is the true way to freedom. You know, Tim Keller, who's a kind of famous pastor, author, he said this, if your God never disagrees with you, you might be worshiping an idealized version of yourself. Like, think about that for a second. Like, if you're, if you're following God and he tells you to do something, you're like, nah, he must not, that must not be right because I don't want to do that. You may actually be worshiping you. 
Any you worshipers in the house this morning? Come on. Like nobody. Okay, that's awesome. Let's pray. Um, <laughs> if, it's, if you don't live life like he designed it, it leads, leads to futility. It leads to failure. And it leads to frustration. God wants us to live from a full, full heart. Like if you notice your life is just repeating the same things over and over, it could be you're just trying to do what you want to do. Like if, you, if you're going from relationship to relationship, if you're fighting the same battles in your family, if you go from job to job and you look at all of these problems and, and you're the common denominator, maybe, just maybe, there's some areas that you need to get right and some areas that you need to live like God has called you to live in. What I love about, what I love about Jesus is Jesus, you know, he's the holiest person that we've ever seen, right? Jesus was perfect. I'll talk about that in just a second. But Jesus was perfect. He had a very high bar. But he was also the most appealing person in history. Like they tore roofs off of houses to come see him. He, they, they were martyred by following him. Man, he just had this ability to speak into our struggles and tragedies and even our wrongdoing and our sinfulness and offer this hope and this life and this freedom. You know, in Psalm chapter 119, it says, I run in the path of your commands, for you have set my heart free. Like obedience actually brings freedom. Like like if you kind of take it back to the parent-child illustration, like you know what this means. Like when you tell your children not to do something, whose benefit is that for? It's for theirs. So they don't hurt themselves. So they don't do something and step outside the bounds because there are some things they don't know, even though they don't know that they don't know them. That's called maturity when you know that you don't know stuff. And it feels like the older you get, the more you know you don't know. Anybody else experience that? Like we know this. If there's any teenagers in this house right now, you need to remember what I just said. Come on. No, our kids are awesome around this place. And so, so Jesus, God wants to set us free, but he does it by, by giving us some commands to run. And now the point is not to keep the laws. It's not legalism. But when our heart is transformed, you know what we want to do? We want to do the things that God wants us to do because we know that that's what's best for us. Then, then he goes in, in verse 17. He says, if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one deeds, Conduct yourselves with fear throughout your time of exile. Now, let me just remind, exile means this world is not your home. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just briefly touch on this idea of judgment and rewards. And I, I'm going to do it because uh, we could teach a whole series on this idea of rewards. I believe it's one of the most misunderstood concepts and uh, teachings in, in Christianity. But I just want to touch on it. Hopefully, you'll go... Uh, do some your own research, and maybe you'll come back to hear more on this. So, um, but not to delve too deeply into it. So, so do you know if you follow? Well, there's two kind, There's some different kinds of judgments. Listen, if you don't follow Jesus, there's a judgment for you that's very difficult, and you'll spend eternity separated from Him. When you do follow Jesus, like there's a judgment of the life that we lived here. So, this is the one that I want to talk about, and it's this idea of getting rewards. Idea of getting rewards. Now, everybody in this room loves rewards. Man, we love to be rewarded. It could be a trophy. It could be a bonus at work. It could be a pat on the back, a word of encouragement. We love rewards. And so when we get to heaven, there are rewards. Now, some people will say, yeah, you know, I'm going to have these crowns, and we're all going to throw our crowns at Jesus' feet, and everything's level. No, that's not how that rolls, right? And so, yes, there are some ideas that we'll have crowns in heaven, and we give them to Jesus. But there is this teaching that there are different rewards in heaven, that some people will be rewarded more than others. And we just need to hear that today. And and, and it's not that we want, now what will be different is that let's just say, let's say Andy gets more joy than me. I'm not gonna be jealous of him because all that sinful selfishness will be removed. I'm gonna be really happy for him. But, but, I'm, I'm still, I'm still going to have joy, but he's going to have more. And so that's, we prepare the joy that we'll experience in heaven by what we do here. Right? We prepare it by what we do here. Now, for some of us, we'll have that little espresso-sized Starbucks cup of joy, which will be amazing because that is, you know, black gold, right? Or we'll have a venti size when we get there. 
But there are rewards based on like generosity, based on the people we tell about Jesus, based on the level that we fully devoted our lives to God. So he says, you're going to be judged, and he says, uh, impartially on how you conducted yourself, or on your deeds, on your actions. And he says this, so conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of exile. And so there's this idea that we should fear God. And so it, how many dads are in here today, right? How many dads? So, so you know a little bit of what it's like when you're parenting your children, that they, that they have a little bit of a healthy fear in, 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 in their lives, right? Like how many dads of daughters in here, right? My daughter's here today. Come on, love you. You're so awesome. Um, so like when you have a daughter, what you want is the person she's going to marry to have a healthy fear of who you are, right? <laughs> Not in bad fear, but a good fear. Love you, Michael Booker. Um, <laughs> And so this, this idea, man, there's this love that happens, and there's not afraid kind of fear, but this awe and reverence and respect kind of fear. This kind of fear of I don't want to disappoint you. This kind of fear is I just know you have what's best for me. This kind of respect that says, listen, you've done some things in your life, and I'm so proud, right? And this is the kind of fear of God that we should have. And what can happen is if you have fear in other areas of your life, it's probably likely that you don't have enough fear of God in your life. Amen? Like when we struggle with fear of man issues and fear of the future and fear of the economy, it's probably because we haven't put our hope and put our trust in God by fearing him and revering him more than, than we do these other things. So he says, listen, conduct yourselves with fear. You know that fear actually builds hope? This is crazy. Like in Proverbs chapter 23, uh, it says this. In Proverbs chapter 23, Throw that, throw that screen up for me. Uh, it says, don't let your heart envy sinners, but continue in the fear of the Lord. Watch what happens. Surely there is a future and your hope will not be cut off. Hear my son and direct your heart in this way. Listen, your hope will not be cut off when you have a fear of God. Fear of the Lord, it leads us to live with the hope that overflows into the world and into the lives around us. Then he goes on and he just paints this picture of Jesus and the gospel. Um, starting in verse 18, he says this, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers. So ransomed means you were bought, you were delivered from, from all the ways that the pre your previous ancestors acted, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. I'm going to unpack this here in a second. Like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was known before the foundation of the world. He was made manifest in the last times for your sake, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead, Easter, gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Right? So this resurrection leads to our hope being in God. Let me just unpack a little bit about this idea. So we know that our, our inheritance, our hope, our future was bought with the blood of Jesus. Like we're a people that knows that Jesus died for us. We, but, but the reason why his death for us is effective and like my death for you wouldn't be effective is because he was perfect. Like can you just imagine? Like it says he was without blemish. He was without stain. Jesus was perfect. Like never told a lie. Man, man, never, never got judgy with someone, never gossiped, never overate, even though he was accused of it, never got drunk, man, never had a sexual relationship, right? Like Jesus was perfect. He did everything right. It was his perfection. And when God looks at us, what does he see? Like if we don't have Christ, he sees what? He sees lies. He sees stains. He sees um, infidelity, man. He sees he sees stealing. He, he sees all the things that we've done that have broken away from his holiness. And because he is holy and separate and different, it, we can't get to him. But this perfection that comes with Jesus, this is good right here. This perfection that comes from Jesus, when, G, when God looks at us, it's as if we've taken this cloak and put it on. And it's just pure, unadulterated white. It is just purity that happens. It reminds me a little bit of Lord of the Rings when, when Frodo put that, little, put that little cape on and he's invisible. Well, if you're not invisible, the Lord sees you, but he sees you the same way he sees Jesus. It's what Peter's trying to point out to us. And this is our hope, that he was raised from the dead, that our sins are forgiven, that everything in the past and our past that continues to try to haunt us cannot hold power over us because of the power of the gospel. And Peter's just reminding people that without blemish, he is perfect. You have to remember where your hope is. Remember where your hope is. I like, what is your life? Does your life look more like culture? Where does your life look like culture? And where is it different than culture? 
If you compared your life, I know we're not supposed to compare, right? Um, compared your life to your neighbors, to people you work with, um, across the street, people you meet uh, shopping at restaurant. Like how is your life different and how is it alike? And then finally in verse 22, he says this, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. All right, let me just remind you where these people are. They're in hiding. Christians around them are being executed and murdered. They're being persecuted. They've had to leave their homes. So they're huddled up. And Peter says, love one another. That just feels completely countercultural. The primary demonstration of our holiness is how we love one another. You know, Jesus taught us to what? Love God, love people. Peter has just repeated that. Jesus taught us to love who else? Our enemies. Have you ever had somebody stab you in the back, betrayed you, and did you wrong? Man, and, you, and you know it. Jesus had Judas. I've had him. You've had him. This is what loved them is what he says. We're to love everybody. This is the greatest demonstration. Brotherly love, even your enemies. John Wesley said this. He said, in speaking of holiness, he was a funny guy. He says, holy solitaries is a phrase no more consistent with the gospel than holy adulterers. The gospel of Christ knows no religion but social, no holiness but social holiness. Man, we're to love people. Like, how do you do that, right? How do you do that? Is it just blind acceptance of their behavior? No, it's not. Sometimes the most loving thing you can do to someone is to challenge them in their destructive behavior. Amen? Sometimes someone need, you, people need others in their lives who love them and love Jesus and just want them to be better. Sometimes it means just a word of encouragement. Have you noticed nobody needs less encouragement? We all can use more encouragement. I mean, when you get a text or you get a phone call or you get an email or a conversation, you're looking for somebody to encourage you. I have a guy that uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't live in the area, but he texts me every Sunday morning. It's some word of encouragement. And literally, in his contact, I've got the name Barnabas. You know, In the Bible, Barnabas was known as the encourager because I know it's what it's going to be. He's not going to call and you know, ask me for money, even though I'd give it to him. Uh, even though he's not going to text me something, he's just going to always encourage me. And it's not false flattery. It's just he genuinely encouraged. Man, we can encourage people. You, know, you can help people. When you know someone has a need, you can help them. You know another way you can love people? Pray for them. Like prayer is one of the most underutilized uh, evangelism tools that we have. Nobody will shut down prayer or refuse prayer. Man, you can pray for people. And, and so we need to learn what it means to love people. Because what happens is this, sometimes we have unforgiveness in our soul. And you know, you know what areas of life that affects Every area, every area. You know, if you've got some unforgiveness or bitterness towards your spouse, you know who it affects? Your children, your work colleagues, your neighbors. It affects everybody. It permeate, permeates every area of your life. And so you have to ask yourself, have I allowed any root of bitterness or unforgiveness to take root in the soil of my soul? And this is what happens when we have that when we have unforgiveness, and the way that you fix this one. So this is the second action item coming out today. Hopefully you have more than that. But number one, three minutes a day after you start drinking coffee. Number two, find your few. Find your few. Listen, the only way you'll live with hope is to get some people around you who are hope-filled, some people who are around you that can encourage you, some people who are around you that can breathe life into you. This is, this is how you can begin to live with hope. I Guys will say this to me on occasion pretty regularly, especially in your 20s and 30s. Man, I'm just looking for a mentor, looking for someone to disciple me. I'm just looking for somebody to help me. And I just can't ever find anybody. Like, where are all those guys? Like, I don't know where they are. Stop your whining, man. Like, come on, find them. Here's what I know about you. If you lost your job Friday, you'd have a job by Monday. You can make things happen. That's who you are. And if you know you need somebody around you, find them. Is it going to be easy? No. Is anything worth it easy? No. 
And you're not looking for like a dozen like Jesus. I mean, he was Jesus. He could have a dozen. You need like three. You need like three in your life, man. Who are your few? Who are the guys that you're going to call when you have a problem? Who are the guys that you're going to call when your wife just gave birth to a baby who's going to celebrate with you? Man, who, who are you going to call when you have a question and you're confused and you need someone to turn to? Like, and it is our responsibility to find those people. Is God going to organize them? Absolutely. Is he going to help get us to those people? Of course he will. But he's not going to do it while we're just sitting down uh, complaining about we can't find anybody to connect with. All right, I'm off that. Sorry. But listen, you got to find your few. You got to find your few. You got to find your few. Listen, we want to be a people that puts hope on the move. Man, man, last story, last story, just brief. There's a group of people um, that, that uh, they, were, they were named um, one-way missionaries. And here's what they would do. They would determine where they were going to go on mission around the, around the globe. And they would, they would buy a one-way ticket. And they would pack all their belongings in a coffin. Because where they were going, they were planning on dying there. They were planning on leaving it all in the field there. One such missionary was a guy named A.W. Milne. He said this. He set sail for the South Pacific, aware that the headhunters there that had martyred every missionary before him. He didn't fear for his life because he had already died to himself. For 35 years, he lived among that tribe. And when he died... Oh, this is so good. They buried him in the middle of the village, and this was on his tombstone. When he came, there was no light, and when he left, there was no darkness. Amen. Like, don't you want that to be said of you? Don't you want to be able to be a person of hope? Let's pray together.